This week on The Change Law, we're talking about NFTs. That's right, non-fungible tokens. And we're joined by Michael Rogers, who's leading all things interplanetary linked data at Protocol Labs. We go down the NFT rabbit hole on a very technical level, and somehow we come out the other side with clarity and a compelling use of NFTs. Big thanks to our partners, Linode Fastly and LaunchDarkly. We love Linode. They keep it fast and simple. Check them out at linode.com slash changelog. Our bandwidth is provided by Fastly. Learn more at fastly.com and get your feature flags powered by LaunchDarkly. Get a demo at launchdarkly.com. This episode is brought to you by Sourcegraph. Sourcegraph is universal code search that lets you move fast, even in big code bases. Here's CTO and co-founder Byung Lu explaining how Sourcegraph helps you to get into that ideal state of flow in coding. The ideal state of software development is really being in that state of flow. It's that state where all the relevant context and information that you need to build whatever feature or bug that you're focused on uh, building or fixing at the moment, that's all readily available. Now the question is, how do you get into that state where you know you don't know anything about the code necessarily that you're going to modify? That's where Sourcegraph comes in. And so what you do with Sourcegraph is you you jump into Sourcegraph. It provides a single uh, portal into that universal code. You search for the string literal, the pattern, whatever it is you're looking for. You dive right into the the specific part of code that you want to understand. And then you have all these code navigation capabilities, jump to definition, find references that work across repository boundaries that work without having to clone the code to your local machine and set up and mess around with editor config and and all that. Everything is just designed to be seamless and to aid in that task of, you know, code spelunking or, or source diving. And once you've acquired that understanding, then you can hop back in your editor, dive right back into that flow state of, hey, all the information I need is readily accessible. Let me just focus on writing the code that implements the feature or fixes the bug that I'm working on. All right, learn more at sourcegraph.com and also check out their bi-monthly virtual series called DevTool Time, covering all things DevTools at sourcegraph.com slash DevTool Time. We first talked Ethereum on the changelog in 2016 with Gavin Wood. We then talked in 2018 with about Gitcoin with Kevin Owaki. We then had Tim Coulter from the Truffle Framework on the show, also in 2018. And we've done a show on Brave and Bat. And it seems like every time Ethereum and DWeb and Web3 comes up, I always end up asking like, well, what's the killer app? or killer apps, plural, as we may find out today, because it hadn't seemed like it had arrived yet. Like, what's going to make people get into this besides the money grab aspect? And nobody really had answers. I mean, Brave and Bat is cool, but is it necessary? Like, is it going to dra- drag people in? And it seems like maybe this is a moment here with NFTs. Michael Rogers, you're here. Thanks for coming on. Tell us about NFTs. What's the skinny? Yeah, yeah, they're awesome. They're non-fungible tokens. Uh, <laughs> if you know you want a, a, an explanation larger than the SNL sketch, uh, I think you know we can we can definitely get into it. But yeah, I mean the, the idea is pretty simple, right? You have these digital assets, digital things on the internet, and you want to have some notion of like, okay, who owns that digital asset? Can we trade it around? Can we buy it? And what it means to own it, and what it means to be the token, is right. all sort of like nebulous. And I, I think that we could definitely get into that. But just kind of foundationally, I think that you have to put yourself in this in this new headspace of like a decentralized web and this new decentralized web movement, right? You know, it, it kind of comes back to something that Tim Berners-Lee's been saying since the late 90s, which is that the web doesn't have a data layer, right? Like we've got, we've got a right. presentation layer, we can link between applications and their views, but we don't have a data layer. Um, and they tried to do semantic web, which didn't really work out. But now we're actually seeing decentralized networks, you know, that are on the internet that, you know, we can kind of leverage as part of the web, right? And they have a lot of web-like characteristics to them. And now we're sort of like piecing together effectively this new data layer of a decentralized web. So you can make a web application just like you do today, but the backend data for that is not in Facebook or in Twitter or in Instagram. It's not locked up that way. You're actually 
publishing data and building applications that work with data that is in public databases, right? Blockchains are, are effectively those public databases, along with networks like uh, IPFS for doing the rest of the data delivery. And, uh-huh. you know, so, so the cool thing about NFTs is not, uh, you know, like, you know, people sold one for like 68 million, right? Right. I don't have any comment on whether or not that's going to retain a value of $68 million. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. Like that's not my expertise. Right. <laughs> but what I can say is that, you know, what people are doing right now, they're putting all these little images into Ethereum as NFTs, as art that they're selling. But what they've really done here is that they've basically created the decentralized Instagram, right? Like there isn't an application experience right now that looks like Instagram. But if you're thinking from a protocol standpoint where there's this thing that everybody's building on and transacting in, that's what's happening right now. People are putting photos into feeds. They're, they're publishing them. Then people can buy them. And that, that buy, that ownership part is almost like just metadata in a database. You can think about it that way. And the value of owning it is going to be determined by all these applications that build on that data. So every application that anybody ever builds that shows my gallery of my NFTs that are in my wallet is going to add value to those NFTs. It's a new experience that I get from them. And artists Uh that are publishing them can create new relationships and experiences with those NFT holders and those users directly as well. So, you know, I, I don't know if, uh, if, you know, you're always going to have a $68 million Mm. image. Um, but I, I do think that, you know, there will be something like Instagram and every image in it will be an NFT that people own. And the average price might be like $4, right? <laughs> but yeah. if every image on Instagram was worth $4, that would be the economy of a small country, right? Like that's, that's a substantial <laughs> thing going on. Right. I don't think the, the value of that image is really the, the NFT thing, though. The NFT thing was the technology that enabled the transaction, so to speak. Like the value was not depicted or, you know, inherited to that art because it was, you know, sold via an NFT Mm -hmm. or the ownership was established by that. That was just simply the mechanism in which they were able to establish the ownership or the transfer of ownership, essentially. Yeah. 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 The art itself was valued. I mean, there's a lot of fanfare around this because Mm -hmm. it's this new faddish potentially or bleeding edge ish technology (laughs) that's Mm -hmm. enabling this. But the value is, you know, in that art because of the arts perceived value, not so much because of the NFT, but also maybe that's sort of like, layered onto it too. I'm sure there was a percentage that was gained because it was sold as an NFT, Mm -hmm. but not just because it was an NFT. You know what I mean? I think that's where people kind of struggle because you got this technology, Mm -hmm. this future technology aspect, look at it. Mm -hmm. And then you've got certain things now currently being able to use that technology to trade the value. You know, right now art is the bigger way things are happening. Yeah, I mean, art is like the the sort of easy first use case, right? Like, I, I think that, you know, you, you have to remember that these NFTs, these tokens, they're just pointing to uh, hash addresses in IPFS, right? For these metadata files and those metadata files. Sometimes. Sometimes they're pointing at some server run by a startup who may disappear. We're working on that. <laughs> We're working on that. Okay. <laughs> Don't get ahead of ourselves, Jared. You know, in, in an open permissionless network, anybody can do whatever they want to do. But, you know, right. the value of these assets is going to be determined by their interoperability to some extent. So people have an incentive to do the same things. And already the big NFT minting operations like are, you know, coalescing around the same standard. You know, right. at Protocol Labs, we're working with them on, on doing the right thing. We have some best practices out. We also just like created a service called NFT.storage where, where we will actually take NFT data either from the user or we're also just like literally pulling it out of the chain. And we will store that data indefinitely, make it available in IPFS, back it with Filecoin. Like it'll be available indefinitely. Um, and we're just going to cover that because it's sort of always been part of our mission to do stuff like that. What is being produced, it's, it's really easy to sort of poo-poo what's going on as like, you know, a bunch of gifts or memes or whatever. But at the end of the day, like this is human culture now. Like this is how we interact with and exchange culture is through like media sharing. And and if media sharing is going to move to a public decentralized web, like we want to preserve all of that human culture, right? Like that's always been part of our mission. It's like the Internet Archive, right? Like they're they're recording it because it's important for the future of humanity, not necessarily because, you know, they agree with every single thing that goes into the archive. Yeah. So the art side, if we just stay there for a moment, because you're going to mm-hmm. take us beyond that yeah. and talk about how these things can be used for all kinds of applications, and you're kind of laying the groundwork for there as well. 
What's interesting to me, and I'm not poo-pooing it by any means, I mean, there's obviously a financial thing going on, but the fact that we've been able to, through this technology, reintroduce scarcity to digital goods is kind of amazing, right? And maybe that is killer. Um, that being said, it's kind of weird because the scarcity is there insofar as I can own that piece of art, but it's kind of like buying the Mona Lisa and then donating it to a museum necessarily because you can also participate in that piece of art, right? I can own a piece of history, but all I have is like, it's kind of like signed by Jared owns this and I'm willing to pay however many ether to get it, but there's a scarcity on the certificate or on the ownership of a, of a point in time or a URL or a hash of data, but we can still all look at that data. We can still all do what we want with that data. It's kind of a weird piece of ownership. It's kind of like, yeah, I bought the Mona Lisa and I donated it to the world. My name's on it, but you can also have the Mona Lisa in your house. You're right. Like it's a new thing. I don't think that yeah. it's entirely analogous to the way that we thought about this before, because, you know, yeah. like, like, uh, I've heard a lot of interviews with, with people and he talks about how, you know, the Mona Lisa is more valuable because it's in the museum where everybody sees it rather than in somebody's house locked up. And I think that a lot of people's sort of instinctive reaction is to think like, oh, if, if you own it and there's value in that ownership is because you've gatekeeped kind of access to it. And that's not always how value works. Sure. But the ownership is your, it's your choice because right. you are the owner. So right. you can decide whether you want to, you know, maybe I don't care about it. it's to me, it's mm -hmm. completely priceless. I don't care what you value it at. I want it on that wall over there. I want to be the only one in the world with it. So in that right. case, the, the, right. the metaphor does kind of fall down to a certain degree, but doesn't make it not cool and interesting, just makes it different. Yeah. It's, it's not a great protocol or a great medium right now, at least for, creating assets where the value of it to somebody is going to be that they control that access to it, that nobody else has access to it, right? That they, that they actually, right. you were talking about scarcity before, and it's like a scarcity of quote unquote owning the resource, but not necessarily a scarcity of access to the resource. Like what it's good at right now exactly. is allowing anybody to have access, but only one sort of person to have ownership with it. Mm -hmm. And to really, really understand like what you can do with this, like as a developer, right? Like we want to speak to developers here. One way to think about this is that there's an asset and then there is value. And then the dollar amount that people are willing to buy is related to, to whatever the value is, right? I think that people look to the dollar value to say what the value is, but there's actually like a missing piece here, right? Where our perception of value, what people are willing to pay for something, um, has like all kinds of different factors to it, right? And sure. the more experiences that we create, around the notion of owning something is going to increase the value of having that thing, right? And even though there's a scarcity here by having, you know, one NFT, you can't think about the value of this being locked up the way that it was in the physical world, right? Like the, the value of some data that I put into Instagram is to some extent gatekeeped by Instagram, right? Like they're going to capture most of that value and that's going to stay uh -huh. within that application experience. And I get a lot of value out of sharing it with my friends and with the people in that medium, but there's not an opportunity for other developers to create additional experiences on that, that add new value to it. They really lock down the API and, and like the, the things that you can do around it. Mm -hmm. Whereas yeah. like on the web, right? Like the value of the web has never been the value of a website, right? Like this goes all the way back to the beginning of the web and, and when the web was competing against content portals, right? Like AOL was like better, right? And like if, if, your, if your goal was to just get content, like AOL was doing a better job. Like if yeah. you liked Oprah, you could put in keyword Oprah and then you would get official content from Oprah in AOL. And if you went to, you know, do Oprah on the web, you'd have to like go through Yahoo and then find a directory of a bunch of Oprah fan sites. None of those fan sites could compete with keyword Oprah. But right. as a network... All of those sites together, linking to each other, linking to other content on the web, that network value was much more valuable than what you got in Keyword Oprah on, mm -hmm. on AOL, right? And this is really mm -hmm. what like technology and networks are primed to do. It's to create like these multiplications of value, right? And so when you think about what the value of an NFT is going to be, it's going to be like there's going to be these network effects on top of that value generation. Yeah. Like if, if everybody can do something with this data and your ownership of it is, is going to be, you know, turned into all of these different experiences in these different sites, well then who knows what the eventual value of any of those things are. Right. And it's, and it's not just application developers, right? It's not just gatekeep by developers. It's also artists, 
Like artists can have these direct relationships with their fans and they can authenticate their fans, right? Like it's not just like, oh, I sold, you know, um, my new album as an NFT, as a hundred NFTs, right? Um, and people paid a lot of money for those just, you know, to listen to it the way that they would in any other way. That artist can do follow-up content, right? Like they can do a concert and only allow NFT holders to get backstage passes, right? And now all of a sudden that NFT is like your gateway into a longer term relationship with that artist. And that artist is incentivized to do more of these relationships, right? Because that will increase the value of their future NFTs and, and even of their existing NFTs. And one mm, thing yeah. that we haven't really talked about here is that the Ethereum contracts, like, uh, and you know, all the, the chain contracts, they allow the artists to put in a, a sort of percentage of future sales. In the physical world, right? Like once you own a physical asset, if the secondary market never really goes back to that artist, like sometimes you have like really complex legal relationships, like around the, the ownership, but for the most part, like, you know, the fact that a painting that you did 20 years ago is worth a ton now, you might not see any of that money ever, right? Like that's already gone. Sure. Whereas like you can actually put like, okay, 10% of all future sales are going to go back to the artist. So as all these assets are, are getting more and more popular, that's also like giving them continued income as people trade them. Right. If you can dream it, if you can code it, you can make that rule set into mm-hmm. whatever it is that you're uh, assigning the value to. The reason why I go to the ownership and the gatekeeping and the put it on my wall in my room versus have it in a public museum is not to degrade what it is, is to say, if you're saying that these NFTs and this this network is kind of the data layer for decentralized web, and then it leads me to think, well, is decentralized web inherently public and accessible to all, or is there any ideas of privacy and security, and can I have my data on the decentralized web that's not accessible by anybody else, or does it have to be this way? Well, one thing that we should all like be very, very attuned to nowadays is that if the data is not encrypted, it's not private. It's just waiting to be hacked. So, so there's, there's a lot of quote unquote private data that's sitting in application databases, not encrypted. It's either public or future public. Yeah. 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 And that, that Mm -hmm. is, that is eventually (laughs) going to get hacked and leaked, right? Like, um, I mean, like all, I think all of our social security numbers are just out there now because like the, the, (laughs) the state department like can't maintain servers apparently. Um, (laughs) and like, you know, (laughs) these leaks are just going to keep happening. So one of the nice things about this decentralized web is that in, in order to do any sort of permissioning, or have any of these assets in something. Their their encryption has to be involved, right? And so everybody has a public key that they're using for one of these wallets. And hopefully, you know, there's a lot of decentralized identity work going on so that we can have longer term identities that are attached to, you know, us and social networks, as well as, you know, we can publish that we also have these particular public keys for these wallets and these different networks, right? And we can tie all that information together. But, you know, that gives us, you know, a lot of access to encryption utilities to make private data and to then put that data and exchange that data in a lot of the same networks that we're using for public data because nobody will be able to see it. There are some additional concerns that you have to layer on when you do that. And there's some some complexity here too. Like once somebody decrypts something, they have a copy of it, right? So a, a decrypted copy of it. And this has always been true of all of these different services, right? Like you could have just like taken screenshots of that data before somebody stopped your access to it. But in practice, people don't really do it. With NFTs, right? Like, or, or with anything that you're talking about in, in one of these crypto chains, every time that you transfer it, you're going to have to re-encrypt it for the new destination. And as it moves custody, each person who had custody of it would have had a decrypted copy of it, right? Um, but when you're thinking of other use cases on the decentralized web, like private messaging and stuff like that, th- these don't really apply, right? Like there's a bunch of private data use cases gotcha. that are being worked on. I think that, you know, we should expect that the first thing that actually works on the decentralized web, the first kind of set of killer apps that are coming out are around NFTs and around public data because it's just easier to work with public data, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like, you're like doing additional auth and encryption and stuff is like extra work. And so we're going to figure that out. But you, you really have to recognize how immature the whole space is, right? Like it's not like there's there isn't one blockchain that we're talking about or one protocol that we're talking about. We're talking sure. about dozens of these things that we're wiring together and, and, you know, often transferring assets between chains. Like there's, there's a lot going on here and there's not going to, just like on the web, there's not going to be one winner at the end of the day. There's going to be a lot right. of interrupt, yeah. right? You have to be a very future looking to, yep. to sort of grasp what's happening. And this is mm-hmm. like infancy really, right? Like yep. this is, if we're thinking maybe in terms of like, maturity and age, this is a, a brand new baby. Yeah. Yeah. Right. This is, this is a newborn in terms of technology oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. and it will mature. Yeah. The, the one question I, I hear though a lot is what do you actually own? And I like when you shared 
a sort of deeper look at what you actually own, where you might have access to future opportunities, not because because of the ownership of an NFT, for example. Like, because that's the one question, like, what do you actually own? If it's digital and the Mona Lisa example, and everybody can still see it, and, uh, you know, what do you actually own then if you just own this metadata and the decentralized web, for example? Like, it's it's pretty ephemeral in terms of what you actually yeah. own. But I like the idea of, of how you explain it, that you have possible future access to insider type stuff, which I think is valuable. And so you may not really care about the value of that item, but you're willing to pay something for something if you get something else in the future because of owning <laughs> that something. You know what I mean? You know, it's like an insider access thing. Yeah. So much of what we own is about broadcasting that ownership. One of the reasons, like, sure. people would not buy ugly, fancy cars, right? Like, there aren't really fast sports cars that don't, like, well, look nice. I don't know about that. There's no accounting for taste. There's no accounting for <laughs> yeah, taste. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> and, and so a huge amount of this, too, is that in public, people can see that I own this thing. Yeah, you're projecting. And, and people can create those experiences that broadcast that ownership, right? Sure. Is that where we're at right now then? Well, a lot of it's to be a part of something bigger than you as well. I mean, we look at the recent movements and, you know, with the game stonk thing and everything. Right. A lot of it's like, I want to be a part of something that's cool and big. Mm -hmm. And so I don't care if there's no value here. Right. A movement. I'm part of this movement and I'm broadcasting that I'm part of this because... You know, I have diamond hands or whatever they say over there. Yeah. And, and I think like unlike, you know, how we build things on the current web, you know, with, with centralized uh, data repositories that are that are fronted by APIs, there's no permissioning to get access to this data. There's no permission involved in creating a new experience around this. Right. So if, if there's an artist that I like and I want to do a fan site where people can talk about that artist, but only people that own an NFT, if that artist can actually talk then I can build that and I don't need any permission from the artist or the holders or anything, right? Like I just say, you know, come and prove that you have one of these wallets and now you can talk, right? Like now you can participate Uh and anybody can go and build those experiences. Permissionless innovation is, you know, kind of the the cornerstone of a lot of like big technology movements. And and that's definitely what we're looking at with Web3. Unfortunately, what it reminds me of today, and like we said, it's an infant, right? Is do you remember how you could buy a star? You guys remember those businesses? Yeah. I do remember that, yeah. You can put your name on a star. And I thought whoever came up with this business was brilliant because they basically just had free but finite supply of a thing that, you know, <laughs> that just right up there. And now you come to me and I'll put your name on that star over there, you know, and which is basically just a centralized registry. There's the difference. It's centralized mm-hmm. where on that company's ledger, your name's next to that particular star. There's a, draw, a line to draw there. You, you can actually prove that you were the first one to do it here as well, right? Like these, these public true. chains have public timestamps. So, you know, if, right. if somebody goes and auctions off all the stars and then somebody tries to do it again on a different chain, Not gonna happen. you can go, I don't know, I have an older one over I here. Own that star. <laughs> this is actually a good startup idea. Sell a star on the blockchain, boom, NFT stars. We should actually stop recording right now and start coding that Yeah, because this dog, has, this dog hunts. It does hunt. I like that. Michael, can I ask you a personal question? Sure. Have you bought an NFT? Uh, man. I, I came very close to buying an NFT and then the, uh, like the, the transaction didn't quite go through. <laughs> but, oh no. <laughs> yeah. If you thought centralized bugs were bad, now we got decentralized bugs. I've been so busy, like digging through the data and setting up all of this extra stuff. Like I'm in the, the, the shovel making game, not the speculation game, right? Like right. people are always asking me about crypto because I do work at a crypto company. And I was like, I'm the only person that doesn't buy these things. Like, like I work at a company that they're, they're granted to me as part of my employment. Like you get right. stock, right? <laughs> and so yeah. I'm like the wrong person to ask about where to buy and trade them and stuff. Yeah. Like that. Well, it's worth state. You're sincerely excited about these technologies, mm-hmm. but it is make it clear you, you have a dog in the hunt. And so far as your employer is Protocol Labs, who has Filecoin and there's NFT things going on. So this is very much related to your work, which is why you're knee deep in the technicalities, which we definitely want to talk about the technicalities. One of the things that I've noticed is a lot of the successful art place NFT things happening right now are like by the NBA is doing one like Top Shots. They're selling moments and stuff. Kind of a cool idea. And it seems like it's working out. They're selling a bunch of them. But are they just, is that, is that part of the Ethereum network? Is that just like they got, cause they could just have their own database and be like, well, it's top shots, buy an NFT, but they don't have to be doing it legit, do they? Well, uh, so that application was built by Dapper Labs and Dapper Labs um, has their own chain called Flow. So I believe that all of those assets are on Flow. Um, I haven't validated that, but 
the D- Dapper Labs are the folks that created CryptoKitties. Um, so they've been in the space okay. a long time. They really know how to build applications. They, they built Flow out kind of for their own use. I mean, this is like a good sort of segue into, you know, transaction fees and some of the problems that people had like in Ethereum. Yeah. So Ethereum is like getting a handle on this. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think that at, on some level... I don't know if they're ever going to catch up to the demand, right? Like there's so much demand to put things into Ethereum mainnet that the moment that you sort of make it a little bit more scalable or a little bit cheaper, you just open the funnel of more people coming in, right? And then all of a sudden, like the fees are back up again. Scale begets more scale. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, again, like this technology is so new, right? Plus because it's decentralized, even the development has like a lot of players who are interested and like I think moving fast is probably way harder than OBS. If Ethereum was a startup, right? It was like eight people in a garage. They could probably move faster, right? Than it is with where you have probably governance issues. I'm sure there's, I don't know how Ethereum works, but I know there's like a core team, but still you have to get that rolled out to all the people running nodes and validate or whatever, however it works. Tough, slow. It's a whole ecosystem. So there's a bunch of other blockchains as well. There's there's chains that are very compatible versus like have some difficulty with compatibility. It's important here to separate what is, you know, a, a technical limitation because we just haven't figured out what to do yet, but there's an incentive to fix it versus issues that like are actual incentive problems, right? Like the, the, the players in this industry don't want to do this. And so it's not going to happen, right? Like there've been things floated to do in Bitcoin that would be good for the people that use Bitcoin, but maybe not good for the miners, right? And so like that stuff in Bitcoin is probably not going to happen and may happen in some of these other chains that are being created. I think, you know, transaction fees, there's nobody who wants all of the transaction fees to be super high, actually. You know, the business model here is to to mine new tokens and the utility of those tokens is somewhat affected by how difficult they are to transact. So there's a real incentive to try and get that down over time rather than up um, because that's just not, you know, where you're making money, right? Like nobody is making money on that. They want to get it down. The same thing with the power consumption. Nobody wants to pay extra power bills. Like everybody's trying to get the power consumption d- down. It's just literally a technical problem that we're iterating towards. And, you know, Flow, for instance, like we just talked about, and, and Near Protocol for that matter, they already w- use proof of stake and use like way less power. Um, and they have much lower transaction fees. Not because of that, but because of other reasons mostly. Anyway, if you look at the ecosystem as a whole, you don't really have a transaction fee problem because you have all these other chains that you can use that have very low transaction fees. And if an asset gets to a certain price, you can actually move it to Ethereum, right? And not every protocol has worked out exactly what this is, but if you look at, like, one of the really popular things right now is uh, called Polygon. It's these side chains that are Ethereum compatible, which means that they look, you know, more or less like Ethereum. And so if you ever want to transfer an asset from there to Ethereum, you can. So there you can, you know, create assets for, you know, subpenny, do all these transactions. And if some of them get to be like a million dollars and you really want to like put them in the more secure, stable, broadcasted network, you can then move them to Ethereum and pay that transaction fee, right? And I think that the, the way to look at this evolving is that the way that you have to scale it is through more decentralization, not more centralization. So the solution is not to, you know, get everything into Ethereum and make Ethereum like so good that it has, you know, sub penny transaction fees and is doing, you know, like a billion ops a second or something like that's not realistic. It's fine to just have these side chains and to have the assets move around. At Protocol Labs, like, you know, one, uh, Benet who started the company, he's always had a lot of vision about how this stuff works in the future and about this kind of protocol interop. And we've been working on standards and protocols that are just open source, open protocols that, that we implement. A lot of people, I think, for a long time thought that we were over-engineering. <laughs> they, they tended to be like, oh, why wouldn't you just do your own custom thing like we're doing over in this chain? And we were like, because it's not about your chain, it's about the compatibility between the things, right? right? And now what you're seeing, right, is like IPFS is being used in all of these chains to talk about the data because our addresses and our protocol is not tied to a specific chain, right? It's not even specifically tied to Filecoin for that matter, right? Like you can you can put stuff in Filecoin and it like matches all of our primitives because like we built both of these technologies, but it's not like you you can't you can have assets anywhere in the world mirrored for whatever reason and available in the IPFS network and participate. Uh, we're not like gatekeeping that with one chain. And that's why sort of IPFS has just become so popular. Um, and, you know, we, we certainly have a vested interest in IPFS, but it's not like we sell it. This is an open protocol. <laughs> like, Give us the 30 second rundown for those who don't know what IPFS is. Yeah. So well, I, I think the, since we're talking about NFTs, 
the best way to look at it is to, to skip over some of the, the more file system-y aspects of it and just think of it as, as addressing and availability in a peer-to-peer network, right? So um, if you give it some data, then it's going to be able to give you back like a, a content ID, right? Which is a hash with some other data in front of it that tells you what you can do with that hash and what kind of format it is, right? Like, again, we've, we really thought about future-proofing these technologies against, you know, future hash functions and, and different use cases. So you get this address and you have an URL scheme where you can actually even path into that address. And so you have like IPFS colon whack whack that address and then you can pass it, path into it. And that is effectively a Merkle tree, right? You can think of it almost like when you do check-ins with Git, you get that hash back, right? Mm-hmm. And that hash is, you know, immutably the state of the tree at that time. Um, that's what you get out of IPFS. You get the immutable state of that tree at that time. And that's really important because in the IPFS network, which is this global peer-to-peer network for getting the content... You can say, hey, who has this address? And you can find anybody on the internet with that address and you can pull it from them. And in a trustless manner, you can validate that that content is the content that they said that it was, right? And what IPFS does is it takes really large files and breaks them up into parts and does all of that stuff, like, like BitTorrent does as well, right? Like when if you actually look at a yep. BitTorrent file, you'll see all those parts in it. And that network functions a lot like that. And then we, we have up a what are called gateways. Cloudflare has a gateway. There's a bunch of different gateways. But gateways are just um, HTTP endpoints where you can say, okay, HTTP endpoint slash IPFS and then give it that I, what was in that IPFS URL and it will pull that data out of the network and work like a CDN basically for the current web. So if you don't have IPFS protocol support like in your browser, like most browsers right now, um, you can just use these gateway URLs. And then we're working to get IPFS native protocol support into browsers. It's in Brave right now. If you want to just try out what uh, you know first class protocol support looks like, you can you can try out Brave. This episode is brought to you by our friends at LaunchDarkly, feature management for the modern enterprise, power testing in production at any scale. Here's how it works. LaunchDarkly enables development teams and operation teams to deploy code at any time, even if a feature isn't ready to be released to users. Wrapping code with feature flags gives you the safety to test new features and infrastructure in your production environments without impacting the wrong end users. When you're ready to release more widely, update the flag status and the changes are made instantaneously by the real time streaming architecture. Eliminate risk, deliver value, get started for free today at launchdarkly.com. Again, launchdarkly.com. So you can tell that we're dealing with nascent technologies because I'm a relatively savvy developer and my head's spinning just a little bit and Michael's getting deep into the weeds. Break it down for us, simple terms, developer perspective, how do NFTs work and how would I issue one or I don't even know how you talk about interacting with them, but how do NFTs work? Right. So if you want to create one, uh, you do what's called minting. Right. And so to mint an NFT means you take the data, put it into IPFS. You can use the, this project that I talked about, nft.storage, um, and that'll handle getting all of the data in IPFS, creating the metadata file, getting you kind of what you need to, to work with an NFT. But then you've got to, you know, pick a blockchain that you're going to use. And what you're going to do is you're going to develop a contract around how that NFT is used. Um, and then you're going to reference that, that IPFS address for that metadata in that NFT. Right. And then you're going to use the user's wallet. So the user that is uh, minting the NFT, not the developer, this is the user's wallet, will then sign that transaction and put that into the network. We, we, can, we can link to um, an example of, of how this all works, uh, actually. It's probably mm-hmm. a little bit better. There's a blog post about this little project called Minty that we wrote at Protocol Labs that, that does some minting. If you're kind of pulling apart these different components, there's... Parts of this that are on the developer and parts that are on the user, right? So the user has to have like a wallet around. Mm -hmm. And there's different ways that different applications have approached having that wallet. So there's a project called MetaMask, which is like a very popular wallet for Ethereum. Mm -hmm. You can use Ethereum wallets in a lot of other chains as well, right? Like it's just, it's a public private key, right? Yeah. But MetaMask is really nice in that that stays in secure storage on people's devices. It's never shared with the application, right? So there's no sort of men in the middle stuff. There's no custody issues. It's, It's always the user's address. That's a really great one. But a lot of these projects have found that like getting people to set up MetaMask, getting people to set up these wallets is actually like a big barrier to entry. 
So a lot of the NFT minting sites that you might go to will just create a wallet for you and they'll hold on to the public private key pair. And that can be problematic because, you know, if they get hacked, that your private key is gone. Um, <laughs> and also like, you know, they could kind of run off with it. You really like want to have custody of your wallet in this ecosystem. But again, it's really young. It's really immature. The user experiences around wallet custody right now are not entirely worked out very well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a bunch of sites where you have an account with them and they have that wallet. And then they're handling a lot of the signature stuff for you when you mint these NFTs. Mm. So maybe break down roles then. You got this idea of a minter, right? Maybe is there a, an artist role? Is that sort of like just only faddish? Maybe for now, maybe the artist isn't actually there. Maybe the creator, the original owner. You Then you said consumer. You got developer in there. There's a couple different roles in the process to mint, establish a contract. What do you think of in terms of like different roles involved? Yeah, so this actually changes per application a little bit, right? I think that the best way to describe it might be author rather than artist. Um, okay. Because yeah. th there is a person sort of creating the NFT, like the, the tokenized part of this, right? And they may not be the person who created the original work. Um, like right. if, if you've seen these sites that do some minting of tweets, for example, right? Like a lot of that is like th there is actually money shared with the author often, um, like the person who created the tweet. But there's also like a sourcer, like a, a per I can't remember, that's not the word actually. But some, somebody is like digging through these and sourcing like which of these might make good NFTs. Yeah. Which of these is worth a $20 transaction fee on a curator? It's a curator. A curator is probably like that, yeah. Right, right. And so they're sourcing these, and so a percentage of... That's like selling stars, though, mm -hmm. right? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't write this tweet. Jack Dorsey wrote the tweet, but I think it's good. I'll sell it to you for 20 bucks. Like, what's up with that? That's not cool. So as long as you're the first <laughs> one, right? Like, if you're not the first one, then that's... As long you know. as you're the first one. <laughs> but no, uh, okay. I, I think, like, you know, not every person wants to go and dig through all their tweets and pay $20 transaction fees you know, for w the ones that they think are going to be worth it, right? Okay, so there's a speculation because I have to actually pay a fee in order to to mint that because there has to be an entry onto Ethereum. Does it have? But it doesn't have to go onto Ethereum because it be a, it could be a different blockchain. Mm -hmm. Plus, it can go on one of these side chains. So maybe I can get it cheaper. Is what you're saying? Yep, yep. But I mean. When you're working on a side chain right now, you may not be involved in some of the other auction sites, right? So right now there's a bunch of auction sites that, that are all sort of like showing you available or not even auction sites, just sale sites, right? That are showing you different NFTs that are, you know, potentially available to purchase. And those sites like are all working on the same database, right? Like they may have some information on top of that. Like they may have some private information that they got from that user about like what they might be considering selling it at or something like that. For the most part, like this is an open network and, and all of these little application features, like, you know, having like a wait list of people that might say that they would pay a certain amount. Eventually all of that will also make it on chain as well, right? Like all of these little pieces of information can be put into the chain over time as long as we figure out the right protocol. Yeah. So yeah, so you have um, curator. a lot of applications all looking at that data and they might not be looking at the side chain, right? Like they're you know that they're looking at Ethereum. So you have access to a much bigger market right now if you put it in Ethereum than somewhere else. And you know, as these right. other side chains get popular, they'll there'll be more. It's kind more of part more. of the speculation even. It's like kind of like which which marketplace do I want to be a part of? Well, Ethereum has more eyes, but it's also going to cost me more to get on there. Right. right so right. there very much is an economy around these right. things. Doesn't this make you wonder, like, don't people have mortgages or don't they have groceries <laughs> to buy? It's like people are just swapping money around on these networks to just buy and sell gifts to each other. I mean, that, I, you know, here's a tweet. I didn't write it, but I liked it. Do you like it? You like it for 20 bucks? It's like, I like it, but I got groceries. I mean, how much money are people spending in games right now, though? Like people spend, <laughs> it's crazy. People spend like a crazy amount of money on in-game assets. I and there's, agree. There's, there's none of this kind of security around it, right? <laughs> like, right. You, you know, like just thinking about in-game assets. So surely uh, digital goods inside of games is probably a rich space for NFTs as well, right? Because you could buy yeah, something gosh. inside one game and then like own it in the next version or on a different game. Maybe it's that same, you bought a blouse over here and now you can use that same blouse over there. That's pretty cool. Well, and there, there are already, you know, creators that, you know, build new in-game assets that are very popular. And, and those people like are always seeing their, their works forged, right? And people saying that they have one who didn't actually buy one from them. I knew somebody who made their living from making things in a game. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They made their living from making art like second and life could, yeah in second life they could mm. and no names dropped here for scarcity and security <laughs> and anonymity but i knew somebody who literally made their income it wasn't a ton but it was enough to live on 
from just making in-game art things that you can use, wear, share, ride, horses, like all the things, you know, like an object in the game that you can use in some way that was unique because it was by them, scarce because they could only make so many, and I suppose artistic because creativity required. Yeah, really the best use case that we have right now is probably this in-game stuff. And you can actually see how this ends up really decentralizing a lot of game development in general and new games, right? So like if you if you can imagine, okay, well, we, we have a format for this in-game asset um, and that game becomes really popular and a lot of people have created these NFTs now. Well, mm-hmm. like if I created a new game and I wanted to like leverage all of the assets that were already created. I just need to be compatible with that asset now. And I can look at that chain and pull all that data out. And everybody who comes in and authenticates with those wallets, I can say, okay, you have those in-game assets in our game too. Totally. And then you've got new people creating things in your game and you're leveraging this existing game. Derivatives, like- yeah. Authenticated derivatives. Exactly. So now we're building like, you know, networks of value and the value of the of the asset, right, is is not just tied to one game. It's all the games that I could ever use it in. Yeah. So now you're driving cross compatibility, whereas the incentive for the game creators before yeah. that was to actually hoard everything. But now the incentive for somebody who's an upstart is to be compatible because they need to transfer that network, you know, whatever your stuff is in to make this game actually worth playing. Exactly. Like nobody who's, you know, making a ton of money right now, sell it, like having their own locked down in-game asset store is going to, you know, move all of that to a public thing that other people can leverage. Yeah. They're like, but, why would I do that? But you just need one to be popular. And then the next wave of games will build on top mm-hmm. of those assets, right? Can we go back to that minting process though? Because I wonder if, is an NFT exclusive to digital? Because you said it has to be an IPFS. You, you know, as part of the minting process, you said put it in IPFS as the first example. You should definitely put it in IPFS so that there's an immutable reference, right? So that people can't say that it's something else in the right. future. Like if you made it an URL, then people could change that. Which some of them are, like point to an S3 address. And it's like, well, I could just go see that for lack of a better term. So yeah, we're we're working with them to stop doing that. But also, um, you know, something that we're looking at doing is just, okay, when we see these on chain, let's pull whatever's in that URL at the time that we see it on chain and put that somewhere in like a, like in IPFS, we have this thing called a mutable file system. So um, there's actually a mutable reference to to the directory structure. And then we can just, you know, create um, basically a file for that URL for every one of those assets so that we have like a backed up copy of whatever it was when it got minted. Like we're, we're looking at doing that. We haven't built it all out. Yet. So minting is a digital thing. Yep. Does it have to be a digital thing? What you're minting, right, is just some bytes. Some bytes. Okay. Right. That's all. So it, it requires something to be digital. Could it be a picture of the real, real world thing? And that's the picture. You could take your title, your house title, take a picture of it. And right. Okay. It. So somehow yeah. it has to become digital, yeah. authentically digital. Yeah. In some yeah. Way. And as the minter, you are the owner of that minting. So there's some sort of original like ownership of I'm the original owner or whatever the roles were you said before as part of the minting process that says this is authentic from me I am me and I am whoever I am and this is my thing and I'm minting it and now the new owner gets it from me or the application or wherever I you know auction this thing off at they authentically buy it via NFT via this process to say they're now the owner of it. But me as the mentor, I minted this digital thing or this physical thing turned authentically digital into IPFS, an immutable file system. I mint it, I'm the owner, and Michael, you bought it from me or you won the auction and now you're the owner. And NFT proves that you're authentically the, now the owner and there's that chain forever. And if ever you sell it or exchange it, you know, on goes the the ledger. Exactly, exactly. I, I think it's important to sort of differentiate what the protocol enforces and what it doesn't enforce, right? Okay. Because you said there's a contract, right? There's a process to exactly. define what you can do with it. Yeah. So like the Ethereum VM like lets you do some cool stuff. And there's a specification for like how these tokens work, these non-fungible tokens work, and what some of the metadata says. But one thing that you really need to keep in mind is that the reference that you put into the NFT that's minted on chain is a reference to a metadata file. It's not the hash of the content necessarily. It's like you know, metadata about that and then the hash to the thing. So, you know, if you alter that metadata a little bit, you get a new hash and it effectively looks like a new NFT. So the enforcement of uniqueness 
right, is not really happening at the chain level. It's happening at like a reputational level on top of the chain, right? Like this is all in a public database somewhere. And so when I, as the artist, notice that like, oh, there's a bunch of forgeries of my thing out there, we will have an open reputation system where they can say like, here are all the forgeries. And now everybody who's building applications around it will note that like the forgeries are not the real thing, right? Like, mm -hmm. but that's not enforced on chain. What what can be enforced on chain though is that if, if people transfer this asset for money, if they, if they say like, I'm selling it to you for this amount of Ethereum, then percentages of that fee of that cost can go to different wallets that were pre-configured into that, right? Is that right? Okay. You kind of bake it into the process. If I ever sell it, 10% comes back to me as the owner goes, hey, I want to have royalties. Exactly. The idea of royalties or something like that. I want to kind of maintain, you know, capital wealth coming from whatever or value. Right, right. You know, there is a workaround here, right? Like you could you could do an offline deal with somebody for money and then, you know, transfer it for one Ethereum for <laughs> one Ethereum's a lot of sure. money, actually. Like yeah, just for, for you know very little <laughs> money. Like there is a workaround when when an asset the current value of one ETH is yeah. twenty three hundred dollars <laughs> yeah. from my understanding. Okay, so that's still that's yeah, still yeah. a decent change. But yeah, I mean like there are sort of like these these offline workarounds, but in practice, right, like nothing but really specialized use cases are going are to fall into that because you have these open networks of different people offering to trade and buy these, right? And everybody can transact in that system. So if you really want to get rid of something, if you really want to sell it, you're not going to try to score some kind of offline deal. You're going to make it available on all of these sites that all can sell it because that's how you're going to get the most amount of money, right? Mm -hmm. And reach the, the largest number of people. And I think something really cool that we haven't really talked about here is that the experiences that we create around all of this can have new types of feeds and new types of events happening when assets trade and what their value is, right? Like this is all just metadata in a database effectively, if you think about it that way. Mm -hmm. So like if I'm following you on Twitter, I will see, you know, anything that you create and anything that you buy and also maybe when you trade it. Or maybe something that you owned years ago that got traded and that's like interesting, right? And that, that dollar amount is interesting, right? Or, you know, like not just looking at a tag, but any tag that is selling for over a particular amount, right? You can take all of these different sort of pieces of metadata and think about sort of shoving them into a relational database and, and creating all kinds of new web experiences around them. And I don't think that we really have a full understanding of really what is available to people when you do that. Not to mention, you know, I can just decide to create a new experience around a set of NFTs that, that have been sold, right? Like I really yeah. liked this collection of stuff. I want to offer something to just those people. Like I can just say, you know, here's the NFTs that, you know, the holders have access to X, Y, and Z. Like these are entirely new ideas that, that are coming about and, and are like, you know, made practical. So you don't have to sell them. You can give them away. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, a lot of the most expensive ones right now were given away. <laughs> A lot of the original crypto punks were just given away for free or, or for pennies. Yeah, yeah. And the fact that you can contract in with the minting process, you know, some sort of kickback as part of it all. Like, you know, the original creator or the minter or whatever rules were involved and how you can code that if that's the possibility, as you said in the, the Ethereum VM. Right. That makes it uniquely interesting because you have a vested interest, I suppose, in the history of it. You know, the ongoing history of something, too, as it sort of travels in from obscurity to notoriety to importance to infamy or whatever it might be, you know, right, all these right. different ways, something can become more or less popular or valuable to people. Right, right. And the, I guess the interesting part is you can, because it's metadata in a database, you can pay attention to it and, you know, trigger things and things can happen because something else happens or thresholds are met or whatever. Like you can really programmatically exchange and, and pay attention to the digital world in the future. Mm -hmm. And because all of these are protocols and because they're all cryptographically secure, there are new things that we could do that we weren't able to do before around securitizing them, right? So like you can, you can literally do something like create a sort of uh, decentralized autonomous organization, right? Like a DAO and say, okay, well, this, this DAO is going to get this amount of money from these people to buy these NFTs, 
And then it's going to sell them on this particular cycle. And then that money is going to come back to those people. And you can even sort of, you know, wire up decentralized finance into these systems, right? So people can like trade assets related to the entire life cycle. This is super complex. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but <laughs> I mean, it can get really deep. I mean, I'm, I'm fine. Keep going. But I'm just commenting that it can give you, it can be really entangled. Yeah, it can get really, really crazy. But you, you can have like basically automated versions of royalty programs where investors are investing in and speculating on the value of these royalties over time, right? Right. And you can literally securitize that into like shares that pay out um, on particular cycles. It's a very like interesting, yeah. brave new world, like a, of what you can do in a completely trustless, decentralized system. And a lot, you know, a lot of the primitives and, and that you need for that stuff to really work is like still being worked on and not quite, this is not something that web developers are just going to pick up after boot camp and, and go into like, you know, a right. lot of these it's like constantly moving. more advanced financial stuff. Yeah. But it's, it's getting easier every day. And in the NFT space in particular, what we're seeing is that a lot of new developers have come in and a lot of these new developers have figured out the right ways to just plug some of these gaps. And again, like this works really well when all the data is public and, and all of that, like, you know, we, we, move around some of the other problems that are still being worked on. But as this matures, you're just going to see like more and more of this stuff happen. Hmm. I have to say that this explanation of it is much better than SNL's version of it. <laughs> ah, well, they, they did that quick. I mean, it was yeah. <laughs> obviously it's meant to be comedy, but you know, yeah, yeah. mine is not a rap. Although maybe it could be. <laughs> well, even going back to Bitcoin, I can recall Bitcoin two Christmases ago when SNL did that skit on it. Like it was like, Somebody got slapped at a kitchen table. I can't recall the, the skit, but like it didn't do a good job of explaining Bitcoin. It actually made it. It was. Well, it's a joke, though, right? Of course it is. But there's always explanation in common. <laughs> so they're not trying to explain it. They're trying to make fun of it. <laughs> but sometimes the best way to learn is through comedy. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's it's an emotional uh, charge. That's the one where like it's like the 50 year old ish moms that were like just talking about Bitcoin. And they're like, right. it's Bitcoin. You got to buy some. Or I don't I can't remember. Like that was it. Right. I put all my savings in Bitcoin. He did what? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they just, they made a lot of money though. Like if they did do that, I mean. Yeah, if you would have bought Bitcoin that day that that came out true and that. just held it, That's then true. you would have been as smart as those women. I mean, the market's volatile, right? Like it's it's up and it's down and it's up and it's down. And we've seen like, I don't know, three or four crashes at this point. But every crash yeah. has a, a higher floor, right? Like right. Oh, oh, if you look at it over time, it's done incredibly well. I mean, Bitcoin is something like over $50,000. Yeah. Crazy. Well, what's interesting is how larger, specifically on the NFT train, you know, which is, you know, running parallel to the Bitcoin train, but on different tracks, right? The NFT train, it's interesting how quickly large organizations are hopping on this one, you know, in terms of there's the skepticism level is much lower. So, uh, like I said, MBA is doing their top shots, and then you have, what was it the New York Stock Exchange or was it the NASDAQ? They're, they just announced they're going to start selling the moment that a new company IPOs. You can buy that moment. So today is actually the Coinbase IPO. And you could have bought the Coinbase IPO as like an NFT. And they're selling those things. So part of it's because, yeah, it's kind of easy money, I bet, right now. But also it's like there's no skepticism from it's either NASDAQ or NYSE. I'm not sure which one. They're just like, we're in. Let's do it. Let's sell some times, you know. So it's interesting. What does it cost them to do that, right? Exactly. It's very, yeah. <laughs> I think that it's even bigger, though, when you're looking at artists and content creators, right? Because, like, what they do already is create content. And, like, it has been so difficult to figure out what the monetization model is for that content. And we've seen a lot of companies try to show up and be the right intermediary for that. Uh -huh. And, you know, some of them have, have done a really good job and are quite good. Like I, I really like Substack and I think that they've done a, a lot for those writers and stuff, but like you can't make money on Spotify unless you're like the biggest artist in the world. Like a lot of like the way in which we, we do media now, like you can't sell the actual digital production. Like, like the, the, the thing that you create digitally isn't something that you can actually derive a lot of money to you. And most of the value is actually captured by intermediaries. So this is like a really sort of new amazing thing for artists where like they can create something and they can have direct relationships with their fans who want to buy it and own it and they can continue to create value and experiences around owning that over time and everybody can participate in that right like it's it's easy for them to go like okay great like i'm creating stuff i'll create more stuff i'll create stuff that's an nft <laughs> like, yeah it's like the the asset isn't rare but the the artist themselves is rare mm -hmm. you know like the relationship with the artist and the association with the artist themselves 
is what the value is. You know, sure, this song is also on Spotify. You can go stream it right now. Mm -hmm. Or this song can be uh, by this artist owned by Michael Rogers. Right, you know? right, right, right. And going back to who owns, who owns my NFT's songs, that list is probably somewhat short, at least. It's, it's more finite than, than the listeners on Spotify, for example. Millions of listeners potentially are more on Spotify for a given popular song, but right. only a small handful of owners... NFT wise of my tracks. Well, if you sell your NFT to a million people, then you're shooting yourself in the foot. Like that's not the point, right? True. Yeah. Or maybe it is. Uh, I guess that's the point with the decentralized web. You can just do whatever you well, want. Is there going to be an NFT strategist <laughs> sometime soon then? Oh, that exists. Yeah. yeah oh, yeah. I'm sure that, <laughs> that exists. exists. Yeah. Consulting, okay. of course. Consulting wow. services. Someone's offering them. This episode is brought to you by Cloud Zero. Cloud Zero is the only cloud cost intelligence platform that puts engineering in control by connecting technical decisions to business results. This is crucial for software driven teams focused on growing their margins. By analyzing cloud services like AWS and Snowflake, Cloud Zero provides real time cost insights to help you maximize your margins. Engineering teams can answer questions like Who are my most expensive customers? How much does a specific feature cost our business? And what is the cost or impact of rewriting this application? With cost anomaly alerts via Slack, product specific data views, and granular engineering context that makes it easy to investigate any cost, Cloud Zero gives you complete cloud cost intelligence. Connect the dots between high level trends and individual lineups. Join companies like Drift, Rapid7, and SeatGeek by going to cloudzero.com slash changelog to get started. Again, cloudzero.com slash changelog. I mean, honestly, like this whole space is really going to blow up. I mean, this is this is Web three. Like, this is what we're talking about, right? And and Web three, you know, everybody's been talking about like when is it going to hit? When is the killer app going to happen? Right? Like, when is the moment going to happen? And I think this is really it. Like, you're seeing a huge amount of adoption and a huge amount of new um, applications being created. And you know, regardless of what happens with the NFT craze, like as a thing or as a buzzword. All of the development tools and practices and understanding of how to work with these things and how to build these experiences, that experience is just going to accumulate with the people that are early, right? And those tools are just going to continue to be like set the standard for what people are doing in the future around Web3 and apps. So even though it is early and it could, you know, crash again for a little bit, I think that the technology and the tooling and the knowledge that you get by being there early is really invaluable. Mm -hmm. I really like encourage people to come into this space. Well, like I said, we've been covering Ethereum for years and Bitcoin a little bit with some of the, with BISC, the decentralized exchange, you know, we've been tracking these things and the technology has always been very fascinating and it's always been like a bit inscrutable and hard to wrap your head around. And I've always been saying like, regular people aren't going to use this. When's it going to, something has to draw you in because it's too hard yet. And it's getting easier and easier. And the market cycles have happened. I've been along for the ride watching it, you know, the waves and they crash. But that whole time, like the community, they just keep on developing, right? They just keep on coding. They keep on improving. And it's gotten better and better and better to the point where they're like, well, okay, it's starting to get pretty compelling. Like this use case, it's a new thing. It's different. And it's compelling. I mean, people are doing it. And what and there's there's gold in them hills, right? And now all of a sudden artists have some sovereignty over their creations, which is new. And they're gonna go ahead and collect some value, then putting all this value into the world. They're gonna start collecting some. So the market cycles will continue to cycle probably in general, generally in an uptrend so far. But I agree with you that the technology is, is getting more and more compelling. That being said, challenges all along the way. And it seems like so far the challenges have been energy use and scaling and then just like user interface or user experience. Yeah. I mean, the scaling stuff is all being worked on and it's all making progress. Like, like that, that's one of the parts that I, I worry about kind of the least, to be honest, where, where I really get, get more concerned is like, okay, how quickly and, and how can we kind of parallelize connecting real web developers today and what they can do and what their capabilities are with interacting with these protocols, right? Like that, you know, you don't think about like if you were a web developer in like the mid nineties, 
you knew HTTP. Like you, you had to figure that out. Like that was a part sure. of your workflow. You know, web developers today don't necessarily need to know how HTTP works. Like not to the degree that like I had to learn it, right? Like they, don't? they understand that it is like a thing <laughs> and that, that like it is in their <laughs> URLs, but they don't like, they don't know. They have to know headers. They have to know verbs. They don't know that there's a misspelling in the refer header, right? Like they don't, like, they don't need to know yes, that. Yes, they do. Come on, Michael. <laughs> no, no, Give them credit. No, no, no. You, you, you are, you are not talking to people that just came out of a boot camp, man. Like, like, they, like, I mean, one thing about the web. No, I'm talking to you. <laughs> oh yeah. The thing is, one of the things that really makes web development web development is that everyone is new, right? Like, it's growing so fast all the time that everybody has just come to it, yeah. and we're constantly just making it easier and easier, right? Like, I love what's going on in like the no code community, where it's just like, let's just take programming out of it. Actually, like, I think that we can just embed a widget here <laughs> and just be done. Mm-hmm. And I think like that is in a lot of ways where things are kind of going. What I really kind of want to see in this technology and and where I feel like I can really provide the most value, to be honest, is, is like where do web developers touch these protocols and how do we very quickly make the protocol just an implementation thing that you don't really worry about anymore? And, you know, if you look at uh, NFT.storage, like that's really what we've done. We've, we've kind of just taken all of the work out of like encoding the asset, getting it available in IPFS. Like, you know, we're storing it in Filecoin kind of on your behalf. You don't have to interact with deals in Filecoin. Like we'll just, we'll handle that. Mm. And, but, you know, like I can't, you know, make the ether- like the Ethereum transaction stuff different, right? Um, I can't, uh, you know, we are not wallet a wallet provider, right? So we can't solve that specific problem. So what I'm really looking at right now is like, okay, how is everybody solving this problem? What are the kind of best practices and things that have kind of shown up as like real outliers in terms of user experience, right? Like one that uh, we found three weeks ago, or I mean, we'd seen it before, but, but we didn't realize how rad it was. Um, have you ever used magic.link for anything? Magic Link service? No. Mm-mm. So man, if you've ever dealt with auth tokens, if you've ever had to like like in- involve yourself in that mess and write that from scratch, which I'm sure you have actually, Magic Link mm-hmm. just just handles auth tokens. Like it just it just deals with this whole problem for you. And so whether you want to have like a login with GitHub button or login with Twitter or or you just want to email somebody a, a Magic Link that just you know gives them a JWT token, as a developer you don't have to set up that infrastructure. You don't have to deal with all of that stuff. Like you can just use their their toolkit. They also though added support for just wallet signatures. So if one of the things that you want to accept rather than, you know, having people log in with GitHub, just have them sign with their wallet and get mm-hmm. an auth token that looks like you, one that you would have gotten any other way, you now have that as well. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, yeah. So that's a really nice way to say, okay, now we can provide like literally like, you know, widgets that anybody can put on any website. And you don't have to have a developer token, you know, with with a service. Um, you can just sign it with your wallet and we'll take it. Yeah. That's like a really powerful thing. Love that. The real value of open protocols, right, is that you get to build an ecosystem that solves all these problems once and then everybody leverages it, <laughs> right? Yeah, like that was what, what earlier when you're saying like, we'll have a reputation system. Like, first of all, who's we and where is this <laughs> reputation system, you know? Somebody will build it and then it'll win. One of them will all win. All of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Eventually, like, yeah. somebody will build the reputation Trust system. Trust the ecosystem. Yeah, yeah. Who wants to build a reputation system though? Come on. Look, I, I was one of the first people to, wor- you know, do Node.js development and there were no libraries and there was no NPM and there was nothing. <laughs> but it was but it was also like a really fun experience to be part of that ecosystem and filling in those gaps. And then when you see that ecosystem take off, when you see what people can build and how many more people flood in once you just solve a couple problems and people can leverage it in an easy way, like, like the, you know, the whole sort of ecosystem is just going to go gangbusters, right? Like, yeah. you know, like j- j- just something as simple as, you know, I want to have a gallery show of all of the things in somebody's wallet. Well, like, you know, only one service needs to solve that problem, like indexing all the chains and, and showing that code widget. Like, we're, we're going to build one, but like, we, we may not be the winner of that, but who cares? Like, we don't, <laughs> like, that's not our, our mission. We just want people to build apps. And yeah, so like, you know, now anybody can have this no code widget or anybody can have like this React component where you just give it a wallet address and like you, you have the list now, right? Like, how many more people can build applications now that they don't have to spin up a database to index all of the content that's happening in the chain? Right. Like you've taken a whole piece of infrastructure and a lot of work that people used to have to do. So it's not just about like, okay, great. We all get to leverage the same data layer. It's like, no, we, we also as developers get to solve problems that like are on that data layer once and everybody gets to leverage that. And we, we see a lot of applications like doing, you know, comparable experiences. It seems like if, if and when browsers themselves have the wallets built in, that would be way better than this whole MetaMask's load an extension. I mean, 
I'm a nerd. I don't want MetaMask running in my browser. I just don't, you know? I mean, it's it's a fine thing to run. I'm not against it. Like, I don't have a reason not to. I'm just like, nah. I'd rather not. I'd rather go use a, a different website, yeah. you know? I think one of the scary things about the wallet stuff, it, it really has nothing to do with the technology and, and even the setting of it up. It's just the idea that, like, if I lose this, like, I lose everything, right? It's, yeah, it's, it's, so it's that feeling. Like, how do I back this up? And, like, am I really printing out this thing and putting it in a safe? Like, is that happening? How do I quickly just get this on a lot of devices so that I never lose it? <laughs> Did you commit your 12 words or whatever they are to memory in case you ever end up, <laughs> you know, traveling the world and being held hostage or something? Or wh- wh- how are you handling your private keys there, Michael? Give us the tips. I am not going to disclose my personal security practices, <laughs> like, on a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Like the first, this is the first rule of Fight Club is you don't talk, just, like, like yeah. you don't talk about your personal security. Plan. Just give us the first letter of each word. That's all we want. We don't need them all. Yeah, we'll yeah. figure out the rest. You know, I remember at work they were saying, you know, like maybe you don't want to be, you know, super publicly associated with working on this technology. And I was like, okay, this ship has sailed. <laughs> like, like there is, like, <laughs> I'm already <laughs> like <laughs> you are exposed. <laughs> right, right. Well, you can have more. You can have multiple wallets, right? Like you can have your trash wallet. You can it's just like you have multiple email addresses, like the one you shine into the shady sites with. You're not quite sure if they're going to be. And then you have your. uh your bank password, right? Like there are certain levels. I may or may not have several layers of security and indirection around this. Then <laughs> 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 that I will not be disturbed. We're not going to get anything out of him, Adam? No. Okay. His lockbox. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So let me ask you this, and I assume the answer is yes. Can you create an NFT for an MP3 file? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's easy. You want to do one? You can show us the best practices. You can use NFT.storage. When this episode ships, you can take the episode, Mm -hmm. the MP3 file, put it on NFT storage, set it up as an NFT, and then we'll see how it works. Like, because you can show us best practices or a good way of doing it. You probably just want to go to one of the the sites that do minting, right? And they'll walk you through the whole process. There's a bunch of sites that do this for you. I was hoping to make you do the work. He wanted you to do the work, Michael. Yeah, I don't want to do the the work. work. (laughs) You don't know me well enough. (laughs) I'm trying to get you to do this. Delegate, delegate. Come on, you're the enthusiast. Show us how to do it. You're going to want to go to one of these sites. You're not going to want to build this by... I I know that it is like the developer thing to be like, no, no, I want to code my own thing and make it work. No, no, no. I want you to code it for us. (laughs) You're not tracking. You're not tracking. (laughs) I'm a manager now. I don't don't write any code. He's saying no. (laughs) (laughs) He's a manager. He's He's saying no. (laughs) Well, we've come to an impasse because I also don't write code anymore. So (laughs) there you go. Yeah, no, but th- there's there's a lot of great sites that will mint NFTs for you. You know, everything from Foundation to Rarible and all these different sites. And and honestly, like your use case will sort of direct you to the one that makes the most sense. Like if if you're working on an image, for instance, like the, there are places that are doing a really good job and have like you know the, the whole sort of experience around selling you know those images. There are yeah. some that specialize in things that look like trading cards, right? And they do sort of card format. What about MP3s? That is a good question. <laughs> I, there are a bunch that I've seen that do MP3s. I don't know which one would be like the favored one. I haven't walked through the flow of minting it yet, but um, there's a few that have been doing it. Yeah. You know, what you said, though, about how it's not so much the value of the thing, mm-hmm. the NFT, the value of it to buy it. Like it, it may have some sort of value, but this whole idea that owning that can enable you to have access to other things, that is really the clincher for me to really understand the value of an NFT because for a long time they're like, what are you actually owning? What are you actually buying? But in a case where, you know, Jared, since you mentioned it, you know, NFTing MP3s, you know, if we just hypothetically NFT to every single MP3 we ship as a podcast, our fans combine to those, we can contract X NFT abilities of it, like whatever, however you term that, how many ever times you can NFT it, sell it, whatever the term that is. And, you know, then we can also share maybe the intrinsic value of that back with our guests. So in future sales, not just Jared and I or Change All Media, our company profits or whatever gains from it, but the guests can also take some part in that. There's some shared ownership of this shared collaborative content we create and then, you know, whatever. And our fan base can buy those and, we can do things where it's like a, an event or something more cool than an event just for people who own changelog.com NFTs. Just an example. I like that. It's, it's interesting. So I said earlier that, you know, what we are already seeing is like the Instagram 
as an open yeah. protocol. But that's actually kind of undersells it, right? Like this is, it's not just photos, it's any digital media. So it's also podcasts, it's also Twitter, it's also blogging, like, right? Like the, these feeds can have any digital asset that you ever want to associate. I think that the, the thing that turns it into a podcast is really just having an agreement about the format and the metadata so that we can create a unified experience around everybody doing this. And this is one of yeah. the problems that, that we're, we're, you know, looking at just kind of coalescing like all of the metadata best practices, right? So like we, we can just work together and figure out like, okay, what is all the metadata that you care about in a podcast? Let's spec it somewhere. And then, you know, let's just go off and mint a bunch of these and sell them. Wow. Yeah, Sounds yeah. cool. Let's do it. We got a thousand MP3s to give you, Michael. Let's, let's get crack. <laughs> get you cracking on this. Let's get you cracking. Can you get on this, this back to us in like two weeks? <laughs> and all the money goes into your wallet, and then I do all the work. Is that <laughs> no? no see, you're the guest, so we're going to give you a third. You know, that's right. We're going to share some of that with okay. you. We're gonna, two we're thirds, gonna, one third. Since there's two of us, and there's one of you, we're writing the contract. Yeah. <laughs> there, we right. there we go. Go ahead, Joe. You were, you were taking us somewhere more serious. Well, yeah, the sky really is the limit. I'll follow up with you guys. I mean, Michael's going to follow up again. I'm a manager now. I'm, I'm going to hand you off to somebody else to actually do the work. That's totally fine with us. I really do. <laughs> I'm being totally honest. With you. I really do think that's an interesting it is. way to consider how you can, you know, extend value because there's obviously value in us producing this podcast and podcasts. You know, there's obviously value in, you know, our following, you know, people who follow us or people who pay attention to what we do and everyone who participates with us in the various podcasts we produce now and will produce in the future. And I think that that's the authenticness of it, I suppose, and the ability to contract and, and design that contract. And I don't know, it just, it, it's kind of interesting. I did think I come on this show today and understand more deeply NFTs and want to mint any. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't think that was going to happen. <laughs> I think, you know, once you start, doing this by default, right? Like once this is part, kind of part of your regular publishing flow, I, I think it just leads to very different relationships that you have as a creator, right? To your content and, and to your fans and what they think of, you know, buying these when they come out, right? Like some, some of it might just be like, you know, a hundred bucks because, Hey, I really like that episode. I just want to show you that I like that episode. Sure. But then the ones yeah. that, you know, way back in the past, you know, people are saying like, Oh wow, this is actually like the first time that somebody talked about this project. Right. Um, I, I really liked that project. I want to be, that NFT, you know, or I want to own that NFT. And then you, you know, you get to watch people trade them and you get to kind of see what trends are going on. And also it encourages you to just create more content because the more that they're out there and being traded, the more sort of money it's coming back in. What does it call when an NFT has multiples? So multiple, you know, when you can buy more. Yeah, you can fractionalize it. A fractionalization. Okay. There's another specification that builds on the NFT specification that talks about how to fractionalize them. Um, and then there's a few people that have actually built sort of secondary protocols on just regular NFT tokens to fractionalize them. And it's it, p different people are working on that in different ways. I think that it hasn't quite shaken out which one is going to win. If I was going to bet, I'd say uh, ERC-1155 would be the thing that wins. It's a spec. Wow, that's very specific. That'd be my bet, too. <laughs> I'm with you on that one, Michael. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> one of the tricky things here, right, is that if you do this really early and you do the thing that doesn't become the popular thing, <laughs> right. then you won't be compatible with all of those experiences in the future. And that's what I was just thinking, because there's like a permanence aspect to this, and yet it feels like such shifting ground right now. You know, like things are moving and changing, and we don't know what's going to shake out. Like you said, you're coalescing formats. Well, it's like, well, in the meantime, I might just get coalesced with my format. You know, like, oh, you didn't consider mine. Okay, I guess I'm out here on the island. So somewhat speculative, even in technology choices and stuff. Yeah, yeah. I mean, some stuff like like the metadata file and some of the base properties, those are really well established and people have already built compatibility around them. So we're looking at just extending all of those for things like podcasts, video, mm -hmm. like all the other media types. We just want to figure out what the properties look like, publish a spec so that people mostly fall in line with it. And and that part of it is yeah. really easy. But when you look at fractionalization, right, like you need to look at that data on chain and be able to, you know, ex expose an experience of, of some sort around that fractionalization that may be different than owning an entire token, right? And like, how does that work, right? Yeah. Like when I fractionalize a piece of art, do I really show that piece of art the same way in everybody's gallery? Or is there something that says like they're a fractional owner actually of that? You get the last 10 minutes, you get the last, the, the middle 10 minutes and some of those gets the start of the 10 minutes. Yeah. So break yeah. it up in the thirds. 
cut you mid sentence even. There's a few ways to look at fractionalization, right? Like, like one is to say, like, okay, well, why don't you just do a series of individual NFTs that all have slight things sure. slightly different with them, right? Rather than you know relying on the protocol to fractionalize it. You can even have tiers too. Yeah, yeah. Like, I mean, crypto punks, right? Like, each one is a unique punk, but there's like you know thousands of them, you know, that were all published at the same time. If you think about like uh, publishing a new album. Like you, you can just do cool variant covers with, with people, with artists that you like, and people will buy the different variant covers, right? You can do this with comic books, right? Like they already do that with comic books. Like totally. just sell each yeah. one as an NFT, the, the value of it's going to skyrocket because there's only one, but you can do variant covers when you're doing like a big release. Mm. You know? I'm excited to see what people do with this because, you know, the ideas just start flowing and I'm sure, and we're at just the beginning. So I think it's going to get exciting and just probably weird and zany you know like it's gonna mm-hmm. get weirder oh yeah, yeah it's already yeah. kind of weird oh yeah you're gonna have um, super so that's weird cool stuff. it's gonna be great there's a very much like it's so web it's such the the cool part of the web is just like what people do with this new idea you know yeah one that i saw recently and like i haven't bought one yet because they're like 150 bucks so you can get an nft for three emojis so you line up three emojis together and then you get an nft for that <laughs> so you pick your three yeah yeah and no one else can do those three or anybody can you're the only person that's ever going to get those three because the, the way that they... Oh, I got to get to work. Yeah. <laughs> but they're like 150 bucks a piece. So like, like you know, you got to be picky. Oh, yeah. That's that's too much. But you can imagine something like that. Like if that really took off, that could be something like a Gravatar service, right? Where like, you know, th- those are really showing up next to people's profiles as like, you know, them. It's like your signature. Yeah. This, this is their emoji signature, right? Mm-hmm. Right. Can you negotiate? Can you be like, I'll give you 75 bucks for it? I believe the site is standardized on on that for the base price of them. Okay. I think that any that people have already minted, though, are probably in the secondary market going for more than that. <laughs> so I love the idea of a secondary market for Everything? three emoji. <laughs> Everything. Three emoji. <laughs> there, there's, there's a secondary market for everything now. Is the, is the I'm going to come up with a new idea. It's called four emoji.com. <laughs> I got a new one. Five minute abs. I'll do exactly. three minute abs. Exactly. Yeah. Oh man. Okay. That nobody's going to get that reference, but I love that you put that in. <laughs> well, we're just trying to crank up the value of this NFT on this episode. You know? I don't think I, like pe- people younger than thirty five have maybe have not seen something about Mary. Like it's. <laughs> it was like right. if you were the right age in that year, you saw it, but yeah. I, it, it's not something that people really go back to. Mm-hmm. Most of my mm-hmm. references fall dead on the ears, especially on JS Party. Like even all the panelists, they're always like, what are you talking about? I'm like, you had to be there, I guess. You have to be in your late 30s <laughs> to get it or older. <laughs> so I'm glad you're here, Michael. And Adam, of course, him and I are right in the same wheelhouse. That's right. Well, anything else we didn't cover? Yeah. I mean, do we do it justice? Is there anything that we missed? Yeah, oh, yeah. Okay. I feel like we got into everything. Awesome. The only piece that I think is maybe missing is people's concerns around climate change and around the energy use and that kind of thing. Like this, you know, perceived non-valuable piece of art sold for X, but it actually costs X in energy and what the state of the world is in. So, I mean, first of all, like coming back to that, you know, differentiating between problems that are, you know, current technical limitations versus things that we actually have like an incentive to solve. Like everyone has an incentive to reduce the energy consumption. It it is only a cost center, right? So we, and if you look at what's happening broadly in blockchains, we have figured out how to get the energy cost down. Like, like those, those algorithms exist. They're implemented in several chains. Ethereum is planning on moving to one of them. So like Ethereum will be on one of these that that uses significantly less energy. It is totally unclear to me how and when Bitcoin would ever do something like this. So Bitcoin may be just always using this much energy and maybe that's, you know, the downfall of the protocol. Maybe that's why people stop using it at some point, right? If they they can't make that migration. Mm -hmm. But I think if you're looking at the ecosystem overall and the technology overall, we're, we're already moving past that particular problem. And we're getting the energy consumption much closer to just what you use in cloud computing and mobile and stuff like that. You know, I mean, I don't know when your first computer was, but like mine had a power supply the size of about 20 iPhones and it consumed about as much power, I think, as 20 iPhones, maybe for a fraction of the compute. Right. And, you know, that that went down and this is all just kind of coming down over time. Glad I saved that for the end then. Because that's the less fun part of it. I mean, it's it's important to talk about that, though, but it's you know, I think that's why maybe it gets paid the least amount of attention paid to it. Cause it's, it's just not the fun part. Like developers want to develop, not talk about energy consumption, except for maybe as you, you know, correlate your battery pack size to your consumption or your compute power of your computer to the battery power. Like you mentioned your first computer, for example, 
you know, that's kind of interesting to think about, but generally I'm like, plug it in. Does it work? Okay, cool. Let me work. Yeah. I mean, and, and if you're just worried about, you know, your actions potentially contributing to this problem, which I think a lot of people are worried about, don't use Bitcoin and like, you know, and pick a chain that's already on proof of stake. If you pick a chain that's already on proof of stake, it's already low power consumption. What's proof of stake? Like, so rather than proof of work, which is like proof of this nonsense compute operation, it's a proof of your stake in the network, essentially. And I, I won't get into the details of what stake means because it, it tends to mean something slightly different in different It's fungible. Chains. <laughs> yeah. Like, you know, what that means in different contexts and different chains kind of varies. So I'd, I'd, I wouldn't want to get really, really specific about that. But the near protocol is, is on a proof of stake. Uh, Flow is on a proof of stake. Ethereum is moving to proof of stake. Gotcha. It's been a fun journey. Yeah. NFT land. Hey, uh, check them MP3s out in the near future. You might be... Uh, <laughs> Might yeah, have some fun yeah, yeah, yeah. experiences and NFT action for you listeners. Follow Michael on Twitter for when he announces our new NFT. That's <laughs> yeah. what he worked on. That's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't tweet much, so that would be one of the few tweets that would be. <laughs> Perfect. And then we'll sell your tweet as well. So That's right. There you go. You, there you go. That's how you really make that make that eat. Oh, yeah. Like we'll all have to get a share of that tweet, I think. Exactly. <laughs> to divide that out nice. We'll write in the contract. Don't worry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you read the contract, didn't you? Appreciate you, Michael. Thanks for sharing this uh, this journey down to NFT land. It is a fun trip. Thank you. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, it's a great time. That's it for this episode of The Change Law. Thanks for tuning in. If you aren't subscribed yet to our weekly newsletter, you are missing out on what's moving and shaking in software and why it's important. It's 100% free. Fight your FOMO at changelaw.com slash weekly. Huge thanks to our partners, Linode Fastly and LaunchDarkly. When we need music, we summon the beat freak Breakmaster Cylinder. Huge thanks to Breakmaster for all their awesome work. And last but not least, subscribe to our master feed at changelaw.com slash master. Get all our podcasts in a single feed. That's it for this week. We'll see you next week.